Do you enjoy the harvest of Missouri through food, fuel, or fiber? Interested in strengthening your community or making a difference in the lives of others? You're in the right place. This is Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. Join us for thoughtful conversations around the intersections of farmer, rancher, and consumer interests. Grab a seat, press play, and join the conversation. Welcome to the last Shop Talk episode of 2021 for Missouri Farmers Care. I'm Doug Mertens, an FMC Retail Market Manager in Northwest Missouri, and today I'll be your host. Our additional panelists are... I'm Nick Monning. I'm a field agronomist for Pioneer in East Central Missouri, working with Pioneer sales reps and Pioneer customers across geography. My name is Caitlin Flick. I'm a district agronomist for MFA, covering West Central and Central Missouri. I work in depth with our crop consulting program, training and developing consultants to work with growers one-on-one -on -one in the growing season. And Brandon Bruce with Bear Crop Science, uh, customer business advisor uh, across southeast Kansas and western Missouri, where I'm aligned with dealers supporting the seed brands and bear crop protection. So today we're here to talk about planning for the 2022 planting season and how a CCA can help you navigate some of the challenges we're seeing in the marketplace today. Now, a CCA is a certified crop advisor, and all four of us on the panel today are certified crop advisors. So the first question, let's just go around the room and see what challenges we foresee that growers will face this year. Yeah, Doug, I, I can take that first. I mean, I, there's several things, in my opinion, that growers are going to face, and obviously a lot of them revolve around inputs and whether or not you can get them and what the prices are going to be. So things I think about that the CCA could help with would be herbicide shortages, fertilizer prices currently, and just how to manage those inputs and to manage that budget most cost effectively, be able to grow a crop in 2022. Yeah, I completely agree with Nick. Um, along with that, a CCA can help a grower uh, work around other alternative methods, right? So if there's a chemical, a herbicide shortage of one product, we can help align another product that's gonna target the same pest um, and help supply a solution there. That's great, you know, this past year, I think there was some key learnings around uh, drainage, uh, fertility, uh, even fungicide use for certain diseases because I felt like there was elevated disease levels. You know, those are all those or most of those lead to higher input cost. And the, the last thing we want to do going into next year is to cut corners. You know, we may face some of those same challenges, but uh, I really feel like a CCA can be on farm and helping putting the plan together, but also making sure we're timely with those applications. And at the end of the day, you know, Maybe we're spending money, but we're improving yield and uh, trying to do the things right. So you guys have touched on a lot of things there. We talked about fertility. We talked about crop protection. Um, with some of the products that we, we're hearing rumors that are going to be tight in the next year on, on crop protection, what are some ideas on, on some of these products that we rely on, like glufosinate and glyphosate, that could be in short supply? What are some options that we have, or what would you guide your growers to, to make as a, another alternative. I'll, I'll take that one first, if that's okay. I, I mean, I would definitely recommend working with your CCA on other options and other alternatives, looking at fall burn down plants so you have a clean field and you go into spring clean. Uh, looking at other herbicides, like if, if we have a glyphosate shortage, looking at clethodim to use that for grass control. Looking at different options, uh, working with your retailers, your CCAs to find other products that would work. I, th I think one of the common, there's, we will all acknowledge there's multiple traits uh, when we're looking at soybeans and even corn for that matter, but the one common denominator is the, the residual piece. And I, I think, you know, trying to use multiple effective modes on that, whatever that target weed is, you know, the CCA can help work with the grower to see and identify what the target weed is, but uh, using the residuals and overlapping residuals, I think is the, the common denominator, getting them out, trying to control weeds before they come up. Um, oftentimes, I think we can all admit that uh, some of our roundups or liberties have been used in multiple applications maybe when we're not necessarily needed. This year with supply challenges we may have to be more uh, specific and prioritize how we're going to use those in the system. I would just I guess I would just add I mean you guys hit on a lot of the, <clears throat> the basics of it in terms of residuals and uh, scouting I think is really important and being sure that we start with a clean field. I guess one of the other things I would add and Doug, you maybe have the years of experience here, but most of us have grown up with Roundup in the system. So glyphosate has always been used. It's been the easy button. Uh, we haven't known a world without glyphosate, but being able to actively scout for weeds, have a CCA that knows what chemistry works on what weeds, we're gonna have to kind of go back to that and understand that. And the other thing I think is having a CCA help you prioritize where that glyphosate should be used. Because if you're going after a cereal rye crop, 
you're going to plant it green and you're going to plant it early in April, you really need glyphosate in that system. Uh, if you have grass weeds within your corn crop, there are a few other alternatives, but if that grass gets big, glyphosate is the only, so we really have to prioritize where we can use that. It, I, I was just going to say, it's, it's a luxury what we've done in the past. We're not going to be able to do that in 2022. Agree. Yes, and I think going into 2022, uh, I know a lot of us thought 2021 was challenging. I'm not sure the challenges are over. So another area we talked about was, was fertility. And fertility is going to be a real hot button item this year. So thoughts on, on how we can manage fertility cost and programs to, to maximize yield, but also not break the bank. I, I think the starting point is soil sampling. You know, it's, it's hard to know where you're at if you, if you don't have a true test or an up-to-date test in the fields. So I really feel like getting a good soil sample or going off your sample, sitting down with your CCA and, and trying to prioritize. I was thinking a lot about this the last several days, you know, where farmers spend money may be different for everybody. I'm trying to think of it as where's our best rate of return or more opportunity. It may not be on those tough acres where we're trying to build soil fertility. Maybe it's, you know, on the more productive uh, where we have a better opportunity, but that's going to look different for every farm and every customer. I feel like you know, sitting down with your CCA, truly understanding where everything's at and going from there. Yeah, I, I completely agree. We don't know what the resources look like for 2022, so utilizing the resources where it's needed most is just going to be the best opportunity for to make the most of your operation. I think, Doug, you, you made a comment earlier. You were talking about lime piles being all in the countryside, and I think, to Brandon's point, as far as being a CCA and helping you analyze your soil test, really going to come down to maybe we can't hit on all five things on our priority list maybe we need to start with number one and work our way down the list because that's all the budget allows for some people if your ph is way off that might be where you need to spend your money at put the lime out correct the ph and then start working on the other fertility and then to brandon's point too <clears throat> i think he's right but i think everybody has to look at that differently so if your farm has been limited by your phosphorus level because it's way low on this farm your money might be better spent to build that up versus maybe the field you got where you're just trying to push the level super high because the yield keeps growing and growing. It's something the CCA can help you sort through. Nick, I think that is good. And to follow there, you know, many situations we do uh, broadcast or blanket applications for the farm. And I think this is the year to change that. I really feel like trying to prioritize where you're at, where your highest needs are. Um, you know, cutting corner, we, we know we're going to have to watch our cost, you know, higher input cost, are going to get into the bottom line and we you know we want to make sure everybody's profitable in this but just cutting a flat rate across the farm i don't know that that's that may end up in long run cost you know yield which is going to end, end, uh, reduce your overall revenue so i think really pri prioritizing where you're at so that's a great point brandon it brings me to another thought it was kind of alluded to that i'm the oldest of this group <laughs> <clears throat> and variable rate technology and, and some of the technology that is available to growers now, we didn't know was possible 40 years ago. So how do you see that technology that we have? I know Bayer offers climate, I'm a fan. Uh, Corteva has a, a program as well. MFA does several programs. How do you see those programs working to help growers in this time and how can a CCA play a role in that? I think it definitely shows the grower where it's needed the most, right? What, what, where you have your nutrients, um, in different levels and where they need to put their nutrients so they know uh, where, what they need to buy, where they need to place it, and they can really concentrate on building those areas, pushing those yields here or there, backing off. I mean, that's, that's so important when you're working with potentially limited resources. To, to your point, I think, and we, we kind of all have hit on it a little bit, I think uh, improving soil fertility at the end of the day will push or promote yields, but I also feel like looking at our productivity, you know, with the tools today, like you said, Doug's, uh, making sure we've got yield data incorporated there as well as soil fertility and then making the recommendation uh, because in, you know we need to pull we need the nutrients there but we also want to make sure our productivity is there as well um, looking more at that rate of return or R ROI. I think one thing too that's kind of changed in that world really even within the last couple of years Doug is the fact that a lot of these programs you know we have uh, climate we have uh, within Pioneer we have granular is the aerial imagery, the vegetative index that we now have access to. Um, sometimes that can help us forward thinking, which is what we want, proactive thinking, obviously. We can pick things up maybe faster in the field than we could boots on the ground, but it tells us where to go in the field to look. But I think the other thing is, and 
Brandon and I were talking earlier about it, just management paying in 2021, and it paid huge. And in my geography, massive, massive nitrogen loss. Mm -hmm. uh, you can really spell it out to somebody when you show them on a, on a vegetative index from back in July or August, just the massive amount of nitrogen loss. And that maybe helps us get to the point where we're starting to think about how do we become more efficient in 2022? Uh, we know that we can be more efficient with side progress programs, so maybe how does that fit each customer's need? I, I think that is a piece of the technology that has changed a lot in the last five years. I, I would agree. Go ahead, Caitlin. And, and just the ability to overlap so many layers of the data, too, with your with your yield monitor, with the aerial imagery, you know, NDVI, scouting reports. There's just so many different platforms that let you, over, you know, overlay it and look at it on multiple different levels. So, Caitlin, you work with scouts. Uh, that go out into the fields and, and how are they using this technology and you other two can can chime in as well but how are they using the technology that's out there now to make their job not only easier for them to find those spots but also uh, more effective and more efficient use of their time that's a really great question doug so our consultants use a bunch of different technology to provide scouting reports to growers we use a combination of drone technology when looking at fields um, agronomy dashboard which is our scouting app and NDVI imagery, which allows us to see sprayer skips, spots that were uh, need replanted or flooded areas. So we know areas in the field to go to when we first arrive. Uh, we have the MFA agronomy dashboard, which is an app we use when we're walking fields. We can take pictures of weed sizes, um, bugs, diseases, any potential pest in the field, report back on size, uh, the quantity of you know what's out there and let the grower know wh what they're what we're seeing out there true um, like a true scouting report with full details of pictures um, measuring the quantity of the pest out there and then with the report of what we would do to fix it a solution provided and we text that right over or we can email so it's just the level of communication has really increased too with this technology i can go check your field and then i can let you know everything i'm seeing within 30 seconds of walking out of that field after i'm done scouting Technology's made some huge improvements in our business. Either one of you guys want to talk about how you use it, the technology? Caitlin alluded to it. I really feel like it's down to the acre level today instead of the farm level. You know, it's going to uh, change. I know that many times we want to make a blanket application because it, from a logistics standpoint, getting that plane in there. But I think today the technology's here where we can manage down to the acre. I guess I would just also add, Doug, uh, so to Caitlin's point, you know, we, we utilize drone technology too, and some of what we've done too is with the stand counting app, and now, I mean, every CCA could have access to that with drone deploy, and that would be a great way to provide a service that they could help you out with. Um, there's also some of this imagery technology too that will rank images and how they've changed from one week to the next, and that's great to kind of help you or help your CCA manage which, which fields have the highest priority to go look at versus which ones don't. Uh, the, the drone technology has been really helpful with the scouting component, especially with doing stand counts. I mean, boots on the ground, ground truth scouting is always the best, but having a drone up in the air that can be doing stand counts as you're double checking it and doing stand counts in the field too is just a way to double check your work and, I mean, really provide a grower with, a, with an acre by acre um, report of what the stands are. It's pretty impressive how detailed those get. And this year, with all the rainfall that we had and the flooding events that we had, those things were so critical. And for the grower to know timely that this is what's going on in your field, um, it's just amazing what we can do with technology today. I was going to say to your point, Caitlin, you know, in the, in the past, we're, when we look at problems or challenges, we're estimating you know, what, how many acres or whether we're replanting or managing that crop. But today's technology, we can get, really get down get a better idea what percentage of the field is impacted and then to what severity, can't we? For sure, absolutely. So one of the things that we touched on there is with these NDVI imagery, we, we can see what's going on in that crop. And, and we've talked a little bit about fertility now, but nitrogen, especially in corn, is one of the things that we really, that's the big driver a lot of times. And so we have things that we can put on with, with nitrogen as stabilizers to help with anhydrous. Uh, we have opportunities where we can side dress. How do you guide a grower in a year like this where we have high fertilizer prices to make the right decision? I think that's a good question. I, uh, I think many of us get the question, you know, I'm wanting to push my yield, increase my yield. How much more nitrogen can I put on or how much do I need to put on? And I really, after this year, seen a lot of loss with the, the weather we faced 
and with the uh, prices going into 2022, I've really tried to step back and look at that. It's maybe not as much how much we can put on, but uh, what, more of managing the nitrogen we're using. If we're using anhydrous ammonia or urea, those management practices or applications need to be different. But then also get back to the efficiency. I'm a firm believer, just like we were talking on the herbicides, multiple uh, applications. I, th I feel like to be efficient, we need to uh, increase the applications over just that one you know, application timing. And granted, that's gonna be different on the soil when you apply uh, the rainfall we receive, but I feel like making multiple applications is probably where we wanna go versus talking on applying 300 units for 300 bushel corn. Um, I feel like the efficiency is where it's gonna help us. We really can't afford to uh, take the risk of losing that nitrogen too, right? So just having it all out in one application, it's better to mitigate your risk and mitigate your loss and, and have separate applications. I guess, Doug, to your point about the high prices, so uh, we were talking earlier about anhydrous going on, and I pro probably had a little bit in eastern Missouri that went on towards the end of October even, which is plenty early for us, and it's been going on crazy the entire month of November, and we're still rolling in December. This is kind of like where the economics and the agronomy both kind of clash on the road, because whether or not that's a wise decision or not, we won't know until the end of 2022. And I can't blame anybody for what they're doing. If you prepaid and you've got a great price, maybe it is the right time to put on. Uh, if you have it, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I think that's exactly where a CCA comes into play because they can help you determine <coughs> it comes to nitrogen loss. So one of the things last year in 2021, we lost so much nitrogen that people had a hard time understanding, but it was in the June, July, the temperatures, soil temperatures were in the eighties. We were saturated for weeks on end. That just cooks the nitrogen off. And a lot of people did not realize how much they lost. And man, if you had a CCA that was your advisor helping you out, they could have talked you through that. You could have put a rescue application on. Mm -hmm. And now with a lot of falling hydrous on this year, it, we don't know how much rain we're gonna have in the spring. But boy, if we have a lot, you're gonna hope that you have someone there that can help talk you through what my options are, what kind of rescue treatments do I need to do? And do I need to make a rescue treatment? Do I need to be proactive? Because in those situations, being proactive pays a lot more than being reactive. For you. Nick, to your point, the, the, nitrog the nitrogen stabilizer question has come up frequently. And, you know, for me on the seed side of it, I, I'm very familiar with the stabilizers, but I'm not. You know, there are several products on the market, and I think that's where a CCA really is needed to help understand, you know, what products do I use? And, you know, I feel like looking from a reputable company, but then also understanding what that uh, nitrogen stabilizer is. You know, there's different modes. And I think that setting down with the CCA is going to help make sure you've got a good valid product. Something that my consulting team worked with this year with their growers is doing nitrogen tracking through nitrogen model modeling. And we looked at, you know, it's a program that we offer with MFA scouting program and looking at the weather pattern, the soil type, and when the nitrogen was applied and it predicts how much was lost. And then of course you scout the field and look for ground truth to make sure the deficiency symptoms are there, but it really helps assure the grower like I'm seeing this deficient program I'm seeing this deficiency right here with my eyes but I'm also seeing it with the nitrogen modeling tracking system too and this is how much we need to apply so this goes <clears throat> when we're talking about managing nitrogen or managing fertility this goes perfectly into the uh, four R's we have the right source the right rate the right time right place um, and so thinking about the world today um, and the number of farmers and the number of people that are actively involved in agriculture continues to decline. Um, and there's a lot of people that wonder if what we're doing is the right thing. How can we incorporate that for our discussion into making recommendations for nitrogen, multiple applications, stabilizers? How do you see that fitting together? I, I think the price of today's inputs are going to help drive that. I think growers are going to see that price point, what investment they're going to have in the crop of corn or wheat or soybeans, whatever that is. Instead of making the, the blanket application, the higher input prices are going to force them or push them to be more efficient in the use uh, of the products. Something I, even this past year, got several questions around growers wanting to switch different forms of nitrogen. And I, I see that that could be a question or a problem or maybe a challenge this next year logistically if we can't, somebody can't get gas or they can't get your super U um, and, and go into a different form of nitrogen, this is really where if they're not used to that, CCA can sit down and help them make those best management practices for that uh, 
application or form of product that they're not used to. And like to the point we had earlier in our conversation before we began was it's so important to be aware of what you're putting out there and that way we are um, showing the other side, um, the opposing side, side that we are being good stewards of the land and we are watching um, our inputs because it affects our bottom, it affects the grower's bottom dollar, right? And that way it's not mandated ever by government. We show that we are voluntarily doing this. We're doing the right things. For sure. Growers definitely are. Nick, do you have anything on that? So, I, I mean, I don't have a lot to add. I think Brandon pretty well hit on it. Just the fact that if, if you're a grower and you're in a tight economic environment, it's no different than the rest of us. I, like me, myself at home, I have several kids. So the luxuries at home are less. I have to be more efficient because there's not as much to go around. It's just like the farmer today. So inputs are high. I don't have as much with the budget. I'm going to have to be efficient with that money. And exactly to your point, I mean, that's right where a CCA can come in and help. Let's be, where do we need to be the most efficient? We can't just have all this luxury anymore. And so, yeah, we're definitely doing the right thing, going to do the right thing. And that, that's a great, a great, you know, kind of different way to look at it. It's like, okay, I can't spend more than I have in my family budget. I can't spend more than I have in my crop budget either. So we have to balance that and we have to use those resources in the most efficient way and the best way that we can to get the best end result. So... Um, another thing we talked about earlier was, and, and I'm segueing here, but we talked a little bit about fungicide and the use of fungicides. And I think we've all probably seen some really great things out of fungicide. Uh, this past week, uh, Nick and I attended the MU Crop Conference, and we heard about tar spot has moved into the state of Missouri in the northeast corner. Uh, so it's a new disease we haven't seen, but let's talk a little bit about fungicides and, and how we see those working in corn, and then we can go to beans. I guess I could start off. Um, so huge payout in 2021, at least across the geography that I cover, just massive amounts of Southern rust. We even had some Northern in there and we had lots of gray, which we have most years. Um, the Southern seems to be a perennial problem now, the last several years in a row that we've had it. When we get Southern, we've get, we're getting rain with it. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gen most generally. So that becomes a perennial problem and that's a pretty hard disease to deal with. But yes, you take the onset of tar spot, which has moved this way in the geography I've covered, which would be Rawls and Aldrain County. Um, fungicide usage, I guess the description I tend to use with a lot of the growers I, I work with, it, it's either can be a home run, it's usually not just a single, either totally gonna hit a home run or you're at least gonna get your money back because you're gonna provide standability, which doesn't tend to get accounted for in any of the economics that get run at the university level. That comes into play. So yes, to your point, Doug, I think there's been massive payoffs for putting fungicide on corn the nice thing is if you're working with a trusted advisor that not only sees in the field, but he also has a little bit of a track of what's going on within his network further south of us to feel the movement of that so you can actually get it on before it shows up. Um, I had a really interesting study, internal study we had this year where we were working with spore movement, fungicide applications, timing, all that. Really cool thing is that we have some technology where we can pick up the spores well before we see them in the field. So we can actually wait till the very last minute to apply, protect that leaf area. It's pretty neat, but those are the kind of tools that CCAs will be working with in the future. That is, that is pretty cool. Uh, I was wanting to bring up a couple points on the fungicide, but the first one, since we were on the inputs and higher uh, price points, something we're learning, and I'm sure you guys are as well, from a seed standpoint or genetic, some products are more responsive to a fungicide than others. And so there's good and bad when you look at that. Some products, you know, you're pushing for yield, you want to take care of that and feed it and give the groceries, you're going to get more yield. But on the flip side, there's a few products that were, you know, across a three year average, we've got two as an example. One showing a 4.7 bushel advantage with a fungicide applied at VT across three years and another one showing 18. Well, coming into a year in 2022, if that product is right for my acre, I'm going to go to the product where maybe I don't have to spray the fungicide just because the native tolerances to the southern rust, northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, some of the common diseases are better. That kind of information is uh, is out there, but again, it's more val uh, more available through the CCA, uh, having somebody on the farm, understanding the products that are planted on that acre, and then if they're seeing disease, whether they should spray or not. Yeah, absolutely. Just to um, off both of their points, I think it's important to even identify the diseases that are out there and make sure that they're fungal diseases, not a bacterial disease, and that you know a fungicide is justified and needed and talking about the other benefits of fungicides, the, you know, the plant health aspect that it brings to the crop. 
CCAs have a good idea of the different products on the market and the different products that are available to target that specific disease. And you bring up a great point that a lot of times we don't give credit for that fungicide for standing corn crop, but having been in seed for a long time, it was always much nicer to ride in the combine with a farmer that had standing corn than one that has corn that's down. So, uh, you know, sometimes credit isn't given, but it, it should be. So uh, the fungicide thing, in, in Missouri, it doesn't seem like we have as broader adaption over the fungicide market. And, and I know as we bring new diseases in like tar spot, it's going to be something that growers are gonna have to consider more. But but what can a CCA do to make that awareness uh, scouting or how can they make growers more aware of those benefits? Because not a lot of times they just, they aren't aware of those, the benefits that, that it can have, have for them. I, I guess, and Caitlin, you may want to address this as well, but coming from consulting in my career or past career, I think timing. I think having somebody in the field, having a CCA there is, uh, very beneficial, very helpful to making sure the application is timed right or appropriately. Nick, you made the comment on the, the spores, and we've seen firsthand several fields this year that were sprayed timely versus maybe a few days later just because there was a high demand of spray. And I, I saw some pretty big differences in disease control on those later applications, you know, didn't get near as good a control. So at the end of the day, they spent the same money, but probably got a little bit less yield return or gain because of timing. And I, I get that logistically sometimes it's hard, but I do think a CCA can help pay their wages and make the, the customer more money just by having a timely application. Absolutely. I guess I would say, Doug, is experience is probably the biggest thing they can bring. I mean, all of us want to talk to someone that has experience with it. And if I'm a farmer and I'm hearing about Southern Rust south of me, and I, I don't, I mean, yeah, maybe I've heard around the neighborhood what fungicide could do, but it'd be nice to talk to a guy that's had experience with it that says, yeah, you planted your corn in June, southern rust is here. It could easily take 60 bushel away from it if you don't do it. Um, versus maybe it's gray leaf spot that came in later or something. It's not going to be as costly, but you want to talk to somebody that has experience. Well, and the other thing that, that we just talked about is having this knowledge. And all of us work for companies that are wider than the state of Missouri or we have CCA contacts that are wider than Missouri, and we can communicate with those and, and have a foreshadowing of what's to come, so to say. A network, network. exactly, yeah. exactly. And there's some great apps out there that can track those things as well, but having you know a CCA that has those tools at his disposal and they're used to using them, it just it makes it powerful. They know what to look for when they're, when they're going to the field, and, and then they can help communicate that information to the farmer. It just seems like it's it's a great opportunity to uh, work together. I think that's very valid of having the network. Um, to your point, because you're you're right. Southern rust moves north. If if we're going to see it, you know, it's coming in. It's going to move north. Same way in wheat. You know, stripe rust, stem rust. Um, so it's important to have that kind of information just to try to get prepared. And, and the CCAs uh, are the ones that kind of help share that. Something that we do at MFA with the Crop Consulting Program is we have our growers on an email chain and they get a weekly scouting report. They get the weekly scouting report from their crop consultant, but they also get an overview of what's going on in the state of Missouri um, by each geography. And it's from the district agronomist and we share about the diseases we're seeing. So if we're seeing southern rust from the south, when we anticipate it being in central Missouri, northern Missouri, Missouri what the pressure looks like to give them you know, a fair warning. We don't just show up on the farm and say, it's all covered in southern rust, get the sprayer, we gotta go, right? Get the airplane. But we're, we're able to have those conversations with them two or three weeks in advance. So what about soybeans and fungicide? What are your thoughts there? How can a CCA help there? Yeah, that's a great point, Doug. Um, soybeans tend to be more consistent payout, just in my geography in general, from year to year. And maybe does not always the home run that corn is, but it's pretty consistent the way it pays out especially with an insecticide, but to me where a CCA could come into play is that helping you determine maybe which varieties or maybe which fields or maybe where we're seeing the disease movement that makes the most sense. The other and probably just as big, if not bigger, is on the insect realm of things. And we generally in soybeans apply a fungicide insecticide together. We see this dramatic yield benefit. The insecticide is usually doing a lot of the work just from a lot of the uh, insects, the pests that we tend to have in Missouri. 
But man, I think with things like we were at the MU Crowd Management Conference, uh, this might be the 10th year in a row they've talked about brown marmorated stink bug. Mm -hmm. But they have shown that its movement has drastically increased and they can find it almost everywhere in Missouri. Stink bugs in general tend to rob, I think, more yield out of soybeans than most people give them credit for. And a CCA can most definitely help because how many farmers want to get out there and sweep net their fields and try to get on their knees and count how many bugs are there, but a CCA drastically helps that. And identifying which insect we're trying to go after as well, right? If we're going after spider mites versus if we're going after um, pod worms or stink bugs, what, what insecticide to, to pair it up with because certain ones will flare up certain, certain types of insects. It's very, very valid because we've got to experience that firsthand as well. You know, and this year, um, to Nick's point, the insecticide I think was pretty big. We had several fungicide insecticide trials in soybeans and some showing upwards of 12, 13 bushel, some showing zero. And I've always looked at that as a percentage. You know, the trials that weren't showing a response were also 15, 20 bushel beans in the lower yielding environments, double crop environments stressed. But there was a few of those lower yielding environments showing a five or six bushel response and I think a lot of that was the insecticide carrying the load. To the south we had, uh, I think about everything we can, can throw, you know, the pod worms, uh, fall army worms, web worms. And that, to that point, back to the timing, there was again some situations where farmers or farms were sprayed, didn't kill the worms, and a lot of that was because the worms were too big um, before they were sprayed and or maybe didn't use the right uh, product and had to be sprayed again. Um, in some situations, I, I understand things were, were done properly and it's just the mother nature, the beast, and didn't get them controlled. Sometimes when there's large numbers, Doug, I know you've encountered this. We've had conversations in the past when you've got a high population, sometimes it's hard to control. You know, when you control the, the first population, you still have a population there that's still doing feeding, so you need to spray again. But to Caitlin's point, I think really truly identifying your target pest and making sure they're applied timely is definitely going to help you save money in your input costs, but also try to net your most return on your yield. I think you guys both brought up another good point that it just really speaks to 2021 and speaks to the need of a CCA, is you're talking about fall armyworms. So mm -hmm. just the movement of the pyrethroid resistance mm -hmm. from the south to the north. And man, if, if you don't, if you're a regular farmer, most of the time what we do, if, if we're farmers and I would do the same thing, you, you know, generally we use the cheapest pyrethroid we could find and that generally knocks back lepidopteran pests like that, worms. But fall armyworm this year, if you're getting movement of those pyrethroid resistant ones from the south, that's not gonna work. Yeah, true. And having a CCA to be able to, and one of the advantages I see with the CCA program is the continuing education that we're required to have and learning about those things and knowing about the resistance and those kind of things. It keeps us up to date of what's going on in the ag world. And so that to me is an important component of it. Doug, just to add a little bit more there, you know, we've talked about the network of, of having peers, you know, and, and I talked to many uh, of my peers or, you know, other companies, but the CCA is just gaining information, you know, trying to share information back to the grower, that knowledge transfer. But a couple other things that the continued education, like you mentioned, but then I also want to say the, the societies, the soil science, crop science, agronomy, those are some other journals and or uh, organizations we have access to as, as being a CCA to get more information. You know, there's publications coming out every day from those societies and I think that's another part uh, or an advantage of being a CCA. You have that information at your fingertips that you can transfer that knowledge to your growers. And knowledge transfer is, is extremely important and I know one of the things we discussed earlier was technology and how technology has changed. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the bag phone that weighed seven pounds, but it never dropped a call. But how we use that technology today, I know, Caitlin, you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but how do you see technology being used by a CCA to, to communicate to growers quicker um, and making them more aware of problems in a, in a more timely manner? Um, and where do you see it going in the future? Doug, that's a great point on knowledge transfer. A few years ago, we, you know, we'd have to wait uh, several days or I used to carry a printer in my truck would print something out and try to track the farmer down give them a piece of paper it may blow away they may lose it mm -hmm. today that information is at their if they've got an iPad iPhone or Android based you know that information is there readily available it's easy for us to share to them or it's available for them I mean we're in the field we, we can show them what we're seeing with the you know text or even the apps that we're doing 
For sure. So with the crop consulting program, we can even identify specific areas, management zones in the field that we're seeing heavier pest pressure and sending them that report instantly, right? 10 seconds to get a text message, open it up as I'm also sending a recommendation for a crop protection product and sending it to, if, if they do you know, herbicide or fungicide applications through an MFA or a retailer, sending that, applic that recommendation to the retailer as well, and then the grower is seeing that sprayer be dispatched out. So the level of communication and the instant communication just makes, uh, makes the process more efficient and quicker so we can be proactive against certain pests. Caitlin, that's a good, really good point. Um, I'm probably the worst person to ask on technology because I live like I'm about two decades <laughs> behind where I'm at. Uh, but I will say on one side, some people will say, well, technology's advanced so much. Why would a farmer even need an agronomist now? You know, you, you can search anything you want uh, on the internet, find any article you want, but- Is everything true? <laughs> yeah, number one, is everything true? That's a great point, Braden. Uh, the other thing I would say, and I tend to find myself this, like in the world we live in, we seem to have less time because we seem to fill it with everything and we're so crazy busy. So what I want, usually when I don't know something about a topic, I want somebody that I can call and they will tell me that I know they have experience in it. Hey, tell me what's the best thing to go with or what's the best thing to buy or what's the best thing to use. Farmers want the same thing. They don't want to have to go and search. They don't have time to search everything and to become a learner, a, a, a experienced person on every single topic. They want somebody that knows that I can call and I know I can get a trustworthy answer and I get it right away. And it's a good answer that's really focused on my success. So there's that side of it. Nick, to your point of having somebody to call, you're exactly right. You know, yes, there's a lot of technology out there today that helps make our lives and CCA lives easier, be more efficient in the field. But I don't believe technology is going to replace us anytime soon. And perfect example is, you know, the high input prices. You know, sometimes the growers realize that we or CCAs don't have that answer, but they just want the confirmation. Should I buy now? You know, it's already been up. You know, nitrogen's already gone up this much. Or should I buy now or can I wait? I think there's a lot of times they just want that peace of mind, somebody to talk to and give them good, good firm directions. The, the second thing I was going to add is, um, you know, we all get tired of Zoom calls. It seems like that's what everybody wants to do anymore and there may be overuse. But I will say I did have a farmer that was last spring that was in his 70s that told me he's very progressive, just making the comment that Zoom has kind of changed the world for him because now he can meet more regularly with an expert without them actually having to come all the way out to his place. And he's kind of in a remote area where people don't get to all the time. So he's like, it, it has made my life way easier. I have access to more experts and much more quickly than I used to. I just see that it continue to expand. So it is amazing how technology has changed. I know, you know, a lot of times I'll be out scouting a field and I'll find a disease. It's like, is this really what it is? And how quickly I can snap a picture and send it either to the university diagnostic clinic or one of my colleagues. And it's like, you get that confirmation just instantly. And to me, going back to when I was at MFA a long time ago and how we had to do things, it was a telephone call at the office. Uh, technology has done so much for us and it's made us be able to make better decisions and help our growers better. And even looking up labels, so like having my iPhone in my back pocket when I'm scouting a field and I know, you know, we need to use Warrior or Indigo or whichever product I'm looking at, if I don't remember that specific rate for the specific pest I'm going after, just pull up the label in the field and then write your crop protection, uh, crop protection recommendation right there and send it to, and it goes straight to the sprayer and then you can see it be dispatched out. Prior to the printer in my truck, I carried <laughs> crates of notebooks. Oh, yeah. Now today I carry my phone and my iPad, yeah. block cleaner. <laughs> Most definitely. So one of the things that I heard during this last discussion was, was trusting you as a CCA, that the grower trusts you, that you need to be, a, they need to trust you. And I saw that recently in an article where it says that uh, it was in the Daily Scoop and it was something on the lines of in the next five years, retailers are going to have to become trusted advisors, true trusted advisors to the growers. The environment's changing. We know that. We have products changes. We have label changes. We have all of these things. So what is your definition of a true trusted advisor and how does a CCA fit in that role? I think that's a great question, Doug. Um, I guess to me first, the most obvious is someone that's going to give you trustworthy advice as a trustworthy advisor, right? 
Um, what's the John Maxwell quote that people use all the time? Uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And people want to know that the advice you're going to provide to them is focused on their success and you have their best interests at heart. And that's truly what a trusted advisor does. And so to me, a CCA, the way they, they're able to do that is just by building a network of people, as you guys have, have pointed out, that have a solid knowledge base on agronomy and that are forced to continue to learn so they stay adapted and dynamic and they don't just stay put, which means the world passes them and they're not providing trustworthy advice anymore. But yeah, that's my definition of a trusted advisor, someone that really has your best interest at heart. To Nick's point, I think as a certified crop advisor, we all sign a code of ethics and we take the code of ethics very seriously. So a trusted advisor is going to you know, do what's best for that grower's operation, which in return is going to be good for my reputation as a CCA and my business. Perfect. They're both well spoken. I don't know that I could add that much more. You know, generally what's right for the grower is right for everybody in the industry. And I, I, um, I feel like just, I tell myself, I don't want to show up as a salesman. I don't want to show up as a salesman. It's, I want to have the ability to have the conversation if it's fertilizer, if it's chemistry, if it's soil health, um, or even maybe if it's just the relationship. I think that is the trusted advisor, having um, that relationship. I, a previous manager several years ago made the comment, you know, Brandon, when, when they start talking family, you know you've acquired that relationship or, or built to a point and uh, are trusted. So, and I think that's really important today. And, and as we go forward, again, as we've talked earlier about regulation changes, and we've talked about the environment, and we've talked about all those folks that are out there that don't understand what we do, but they think what we're doing is bad. We have to have that relationship, not only with our growers, that they trust us, that we're doing the right thing, but it helps us model to the rest of the world that what we're doing is right. And I think one of the ways that I think about that is, you know, maybe not everyone knows what it takes to become a CCA. And so maybe we should talk about that a little bit, what, what it takes to become a CCA, because it's not just an honorary title you get. It's more than that. So I know, Brandon, you've been pretty influential in, in working with this. So do you want to share? Yes. I mean, so there, yeah, it, it's uh, something that I think we all should hold uh, highly, uh, certification, um, depending on your education and experience. Um, there's, if you've got a bachelor's degree, there's two years of experience required as well. So I guess in general, you want four years of experience in the agronomy field or crop advising uh, field. And then plus, you got to test in at your state and at the ICCA level. And then once you pass those tests, there's the continuing education credits um, you've got to maintain every two years, which I really feel like holds, holds yourself or holds an individual above uh, the rest with that certification. Well, and you're also, and I've always been a fan. People have asked me because I've been a CCA since 1994. It's like, why, why are you still a CCA? And it's like, because it forces me, and I don't know if force is a good word, but I have to continually learn. And this industry has changed so much in 40 years that if you stop learning and if you stop having that drive to learn, and if you, you get behind really quickly. And so to me, that's been one of the things that I've liked most about the CCA. Not that it forces me, but I have to continue to learn what's going on in the industry that I'm involved in. It keeps you engaged, yeah. Doug, you know this, you know, age is only a number, but as long as you're learning, I feel like you're young, trying to, tr trying to learn more information. And I, I've always said that as well. It, it forces me, it, I say that it doesn't force me, but it keeps me engaged. Chemistry changes, you know, the last role I was more seed focused and chemistry changes so so fast. It's not that there's a bunch of new modes of action, but there's a lot of premixes. But labels change from year to year on, uh, you know, the use rates, the applications. If you have a high soil pH, um, there's several different things. And I think continuing that education, like Nick said, um, really keeps you fresh and up to date, and making sure you're making solid recommendations for that are best for the grower. So thank you for joining us here today. And if you would like to learn more about the Certified Crop Advisor program, you can go to certifiedcropadvisor.org and there you can search by zip code for the CCAs that are near you. Happy holidays. Thank you for joining the Stand for Ag podcast with Missouri Farmers Care. We're excited to bring you new stories each week. We as agriculturalists have a lot of stories to tell. Stories of resilience, grit, 
and stories of families that are united by their passion for agriculture. Each week, tune in for a new episode and join the conversation.